so special education, um, generally in, in Somali cultural practices, it was not, uh, people did not have this service. Uh, you know, people with uh, physical, uh, you know, um, ailment or, you know, uh, mental, they, you know, fa their family had to cope with them. So the understanding in the Somali mindset is if somebody is considered uh, or referred for, physical, uh, for, for special education, the understanding is this person is mentally, you know, retarded or something. So there's a stigma, negativity to it. That we don't have that concept of the wide range of uh, special education services. So real education needs to happen, educating the family, telling them the, you know, that there's a, it's not a permanent label on the child. It does not go on the certificate. Um, you know, the time frame that it, once, they, once we see progress and there's improvements, could there's speech, there is vision, there are so many ways of, so, so um, either you have to go, your school has to educate your parents about that or um, maybe using uh, community resources to come in and educate them, but generally they will resist. So they would, most parents will, will say, oh, especially ADHD, you know, in Somali culture, you know, kids are active and boys are boys and so it's not recognized, it's not diagnosed as a, as a problem. So sometimes they will say, why are these schools, you know, complaining and, you know, talking about my boy is, is just active and is just playing and in, at home that's the way he, he, he acts. So there is that um, misunderstanding and so educators need to be very conscious, you know, cautious and conscientiously educate the families and tell them what this really means, yeah. Um, for the music class, um, um, again, uh, there are some Muslims who don't, don't listen to music. So sometimes, uh, let's say music class, some parents may request their child to be not in that class. So if that comes up, then just work in, you know, with that parent. Um, physical education class, it's more about, um, you know, co, for example, uh, boys and girls together for them in swimming or some, you know, activities. There is that, again, modesty issue. So girls would not you know, want to participate in those classes. So they may request to opt out or another alternative. Um, in the arts class, sometimes drawing, um, you know, uh, living objects, especially uh, with a soul like, like human beings or, or animals, uh, Muslims uh, object to drawing uh, them. So there are times when uh, the teacher tells the child to draw their portrait or a portrait of somebody and they said, you know, I don't want to draw. It's not very common and even among the Muslim scholars there is disagreement there. There are some who would say um, this is education and, you know, it's not. Uh, the, what the religion is really trying to avoid is idol worship or, you know, making images and, you know, putting, so, so some, some scholars interpret it that way. But again, if if a child or a family says we don't want our child, you know, to draw or something, you know, if you can, it it, it it comes up sometimes. It's not very common, but sometimes it may come up. Um, for the science class, it's uh, it's about um, the evolution. Sometimes, some, like Muslims believe God created uh, you know human beings in the best form, and so sometimes they may question you know the theory of evolution. And maybe using a pig for experiments, like you know, touching that, dissecting it, and again, there will be objection to, to that. Um, health education, um, again, when it comes to, let's say, especially about uh, maturity and sexuality, and the, you know, the child, you know, changing and so on. Um, there may be. You know, sex in general in, in, in the Muslim community or in the Somali culture in particular is a taboo topic. So, you know, referring to sex and sexuality or by name or, you know, referring to those, it's something kind of uh, very sensitive. So, uh, again, you know, um, just being uh, cautious there or at least uh, I think even in, 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 in public schools, they need parental uh, consent and to be aware and who's presenting it and, and how. I think all those are very significant, so there, will, there are objections to some of those classes. When it comes to the language, um, Somali language uses uh, Latin script, so it's written like English, but some sounds or some of the pronunciation of, of some of the sounds um, are not in Somali and they are in English, so you may hear, for example, the per and ber sound. Somali doesn't have the p sound, per. 
So both of them are ba to the Somali person. So <coughs> you would say, if you say pen and ben, ben the name and pen for writing that same to the ear of a Somali child, for example. And, and also the v and the f sound both become the f. So fan and van will be the same to, to the ear. So intentionally teaching these pronunciations and um, maybe p placing a piece of paper in front of you when you say p, there's air coming out of your mouth, and when you say ba, there's none. In, in, being you know, in, in intentionally teaching about it. With the adults, especially, that, even when they're speaking, you, you can notice in their speech a lot, like, you know, people, somebody will say people and uh, bark, and when they mean park, and, and so on. So just be, you know, uh, picking out some of those sounds. Um, and then also the past tense. The, the ED is, is, is overemphasized sometimes, like jump, the Somali person will say jump it or walk it. You know, so sometimes that happens. Here, the, for the religious celebrations, um, the month of Ramadan or fasting is a very significant month in the Islamic religion. It's a whole month of abstaining from food and drink from sunrise until sunset. Um, it's a kind of, there's a sense of spirituality in the community and the whole, you know, environment changes and you hear a lot of reference to this month. And uh, in a school setting, although now it's going to be going out of, getting out of the school year, because Ramadan in this, this year will be starting in August, uh, August 10th. So schools will open uh, toward the beginning of September, so Ramadan will almost be over by then. But it used to be an issue, I'm sure you've, you've already gone through that, those of you who have had Muslim students in your classes. So uh, this year it will be from August 10th until September 10th. And then right after when Ramadan ends, is a big celebration, Eid. Um, and that's a huge celebration called a Feast of Breaking the Fast. And this, on this day, um, Muslims would not go to work, children would not go to school. It's a more community uh, celebration. This is the day that they go to the Mall of America in, in big numbers on the rides. Yeah. So I'm sure the mall, they have this date in their, in their calendar, I'm sure. <laughs> so, and then uh, the other big feast is called Eid al-Adha. Eid al-Adha, can you say that? Eid al-Adha. And then the other one is Eid al-Fitr. Right. So the other one is uh, observed during the pilgrimage to Mecca when Muslims go to the annual pilgrimage um, and and during that time, uh, this sacrifice is referring to Abraham um, having a vision to sacrifice his son and God replacing it with a ram and he didn't have to, have to sacrifice his son. So it's, it's in, in observation of that. And this is expected to be in November this year. So it could be a little before Thanksgiving. So Ramadan, again, uh, used to be a very big issue in school because the, the children would not be eating any food. Uh, but as a general understanding, um, um, it's a whole month. Muslims start eating food from sunset, and they can keep eating until, you know, uh, close to sunset the next sunrise the next day. And there are people exempt from fasting. For example, children before the age of puberty, they don't have to fast, but some choose to just to pick the habit and get used to it. Um, the elderly, somebody who's too old to withstand the hardship. If they are too old, then it will, they'll be exempted from fasting. Pregnant women, uh, the sick, somebody who is sick. So there are exceptions to the rule. Most of these people, they will make it up after Ramadan. After the month ends, they will have to make up the days that they missed. Um, so th that, that rule is there that uh, not everyone, uh, there are some exceptions. It takes people's limitations and, and uh, uh, ability into consideration. But again, it's one of the pillars of Islam, you know, fasting Ramadan. It's one of the main pillars of the religion. Yeah, this slide will just skip it. Uh, here about the dress code and the hijab for the Muslim women. Um, it's also it's religiously prescribed in the, in the Quran, the Islamic holy book, that Muslim girls, when they mature, uh, attain the age of puberty, you know, they need to observe the, the, the hijab or the, the hijab basically means to, co to, co to cover or to conceal, um, that's the literal meaning of the word. Um, again, there are some restrictions on the men also, which we don't usually hear. 
So for example, Muslim, Muslim men are to cover from the navel to the knees all the time. So that should never be exposed, even if they are playing sports or something. And also, um, men don't wear silk and gold. Those are reserved for women. So sometimes women have better things than men in, in, in some ways. <laughs> you, all, you always hear um, you know, women's rights. And so here, you know, this good stuff, women are having it. Um, and then uh, the hijab, again, or the hair scarf. Um, so they cover from unrelated meals. So for example, um, they have the father or their, their husband, their brother, they don't have to cover themselves. So if they're at home with those meals, then they, they will not cover. Um, again, some Muslim women choose not to cover, but, uh, but we have to understand that within that accountability system of Islam, it's like they are, they are you know, not following the Quranic injunction, so it will be written against them. So as a religious prescription, it's there, it's you know, agreed upon, but the choice is up to the person. You know, some people choose and others not to, but there is consequence in the accountability system of the faith. And the general um, uh, requirement or descriptions of the hijab is to be long and to, you know, to cover the, the body, to be thick and also to be loose enough. So those are the general descrip uh, descriptions. Um, but there are variations as you have seen in the Muslim world. There, are, you know, there is no particular color, there is no particular sewing style. As long as the material meets these general requirements, then it will meet the requirements for for hijab and uh, this is more about the religious aspects and I'm assuming most uh, you know people are now familiar with the general Islamic teaching these are called the five pillars and uh, so maybe before I go into those any questions about what we have covered uh, about the hijab about the fasting <coughs> Yeah, Ramadan is determined by two ways. One of them is physically sighting the new crescent, like when the new moon crescent comes out and is sighted, then that's how Ramadan begins. And majority of Muslims follow that route. There are others, uh, it's a new kind of um, trend now to use calculation because they're saying uh, scientifically, you know, the birth of the moon is known and when it will be visible to the naked eyes is, is known. So, you know, kind of uh, calculating it in, in advance. But the sighting is the more uh, uh, one that has evidence from the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. And so many Muslims want to abide by that. So that's why it's sometimes it's difficult to know in advance when it's going to start until we see sunset of the day before. And then we see the crescent that night. Then the next day is the, is the fasting. So sometimes it's inconvenient for schools and for you know, institutions to really know in advance when it's starting. And uh, some are going with the calculation. So in advance, they will tell you, this is what Ramadan starts and this is the end. But majority of Muslims still follow the physical sighting. Yes? Yes, yeah, yes, exactly. So the, yeah, the Islamic calendar uh, is a lunar calendar. So every year it shifts by about 11 days. That's why Ramadan has now moved away from the school year is now moving towards this summer. And it, it rotates, it goes around the whole year. So in a time, you know, people will fast every time of the year. So that's fairness, I guess. <laughs> Especially in America, we used to have it very easy, you know, short winter. And so starting from probably this year is going to be a, a, a more, more hours of fasting. So as long as the sun is out, no food. So a time will come when we will do it from, let's say, maybe maybe 4.30 a.m. until 9 p.m. Maybe in July, June, whenever that comes, in a couple of years, yeah. So that will be the real test, yeah. <laughs> yes. In Pakistan, the breaking of a fast during Ramadan is important. Is it the same for Islam? It's important, yeah, in all Muslim uh, countries, yeah. It, it's, a, it's a kind of general uh, family coming together and delicious special meals prepared. Usually it's broken with dates and water and juice and so usually uh, that's why the kids want to be part of that, you know, sitting, coming to the table and oh, I, all day I didn't eat and you know, so you have nine year olds, eight year olds completing the whole month. It's not unusual. <laughs> it's tough. Some people think, oh, are they, are they really okay? Can they survive? They, they, they do survive, you know, you know, human beings are resilient and it's just a matter of getting used to it.
It's a question that any new immigrant group faces. There's always that uh, connection to the homeland, and uh, we're going back. And yes, most, most of the adults like who knew peaceful Somalia and who remember Mogadishu, the beautiful Mogadishu, they have that sense of when there is peace, I'll go back. But the reality is uh, the situation in Somalia now, and uh, the more you know, people stay, you do see uh, you know, more people you know, uh, uh, you know, settling down. But the reality is, uh, especially with the kids growing up here, they who have never you know, uh, seen or only heard about negative things about Somalia, they will stay here. So, so you, that, yeah, that conversation happens. But we hear, like other, uh, other immigrant groups, or even other Muslims who have been here for many years, that uh, back home syndrome, they, they say, like people who say, I'm going back next year, and they're here 50 years and 60 years, and they're still. So, so as a community, like for example, uh, educators and uh, mosques, we do tell people to plan you know, uh, and, and invest and you know, plan to settle. If, they, if things, you know, circumstances come, you go back, you know, that's fine. But not to remain standing on one foot and your, you know, still your uh, bags and, and, and tied somewhere. And, you know, so, so the reality is most Somalis would probably would not go back uh, if things, you know, the, the more they stay, the more people invest. And now they are buying homes, they are resettling, and yeah. Do you find that they are? I mean, as in any community, there, is, there are those different views and opinions. Um, but generally speaking, the Minnesota experience has been positive. Uh, you know, community feels really welcome. Uh, initially, of course, there's a lot of fear. Let's say coming to America will change my faith, and I'm going to lose my kids. And there's a real, real fear, you know, when they are coming in the beginning. Um, but, and they, and they, again, they still feel the challenge, especially raising kids. There's real worry, you know, um, especially, you know. Uh, Teenagers now joining gangs, and you know, a lot of them instead of picking the good American values, picking more the negative ones. And so many parents really are worried about that, and you know, would want to leave. But again, it's, it's not easy. You know, where do you go, and you know, which other country will be as accommodating as accepting? Um, so some they they go like they send their families, let's say, to another country, and then a lot of them end up coming back. Some leave, of course. I mean. So again, it's just that human struggle of there are some regions you know, of Somalia that are pretty stable. Um, there are two semi-autonomous regions, so they have their own, you know, internal government. They're functioning and they're pretty okay. The most violent is Mogadishu, the capital, and the southern part of the country. Um, so you know, it's just a matter of avoiding, you know, the the real conflict uh, areas. But there are parts of Somalia that one will go to with peace, and there's no problem. So uh, you know, it just depends on you know the part of the country. But uh, in Mogadishu, for example, there's really random violence, and even without somebody really coming after you, the, uh, the possibility of being you know hit by a stray bullet or being in an area where there's gunfight is very possible. So it's not really a safe place to go to, especially in the southern part of Somalia. But the eastern part, the northern part, pretty stable. People go there all the time, and uh, so I mean as. You know, in spite of all this, life goes on. There are a lot of businesses, there are schools functioning, there are universities functioning. So we shouldn't assume that all of Somalia is uh, really, you know, uh, terrible. I mean, people are, they're just the idea of central government and functioning government is really missing, and there's a lot of yearning for that. But uh, there, life goes on. You'll be amazed, especially business, uh, um, especially communications. Now I'm hearing people in the countryside, they normally have cell phones and satellites. Uh, Dishes and it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yes. The youth, um, you know, who, who went back to Somalia, um, and that was really it took the whole community by surprise, and it really shook, and you know, the whole community. Um, um, but the reality is, uh, there is no real active recruitment, even after all the FBI investigations, even the mosques that were accused, or all of that. There's no real. It has not led to any direct, you know, mosque involvement or religious leaders. So it's more youth influencing youth and the internet. And, and the primary catalyst, I think, was the Ethiopian invasion of Somalia in 2006. So there was a sense of nationalism. And, you know, so, you know, it seems um, um, people tapped into that youth, uh, you know, uh, energy. But happily, you know, none have left since November. 
Um, the political situation even in Somalia is changing. Um, and so um, w right now we don't see a real threat of that being aware that you know, Somali youth are going back. But again, the challenge is why, you know, you know, why would uh, you know, a, a kid who came here as a toddler or even born in another country would choose to go back to Mogadishu as it is today? Um, so there is no real active recruitment in the Twin Cities, but that, that it's more that nationalism and you know, let's free our country from Ethiopia kind of that uh, was tapped into at that time through the internet and, um, and, 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 and you know, uh, cyber space. That was how most of the re recruiting happened. And so right now, happily, it, it, things are stable and, uh, and the community also really spoke up and, um, you know, uh, in the mosques and the educators, we all, you know, said, you know, we should not hide or, you know, we should speak up and if we see anybody engage in this kind of activity, we should not allow it in within us. And so, um, so it's, it has calmed down right now. Yeah, mostly it's through uh, re the refugee camps. I mean, there, there are many Somalis still in, in Kenya. And most of those coming now are through family reunion, like uh, relatives who are here will petition for their families, feel for them, and then uh, that's how many of them are coming in. But uh, it's a process that the, the government, the US government and the refugee sponsoring agencies, mostly you know, Catholic charities uh, and, and some of the other organizations, uh, uh, kind of process the, and, and depending on the number of uh, yeah the, uh, that every year they you know give a, a lot a number of people to come into the U.S. through that process. So generally speaking, Somalis already have their uh, approval for resettlement. So the issue of uh, undocumented uh, is not an issue at all. Most have their legal documents when they come and they move on green card for five years and then they become citizens. So now mo most many of them are becoming citizens. If you go to any swearing in ceremony, you will, Somalia will be very visible because that, those large numbers are now becoming citizens, so more participating in the political system, more in the voting, more. You can see a lot of, uh, you know, long-term investment and, 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 you know, in the lot of engagement now, right now. Then.